On this episode, I speak to landscape photographer Neil Prothero about his move from being a UK-based photographer who made the move to New Zealand and the challenges that he faced in that process. Now, Neil decided to reach out to the show by leaving a message. If you leave a message for the show and I feel that it's relevant, then I'm going to play it on a show. So here is Neil's message. Hi there, Jay, and good morning to you from New Zealand. My name is Neil Prothero. Um, I've just been listening to your interview with Sarah Howard um, on your website. Sarah is a very good friend of mine. And in fact, I worked with her uh, in the early days of her workshop business um, some 12 years ago, actually. Um, I've since started my own um, photography workshop uh, and tour business here in New Zealand, uh, we run tuition workshops, social photography weekends, and latterly uh, international tours. I was wondering if you might be interested in having a chat. Um, my website is www.neilprothero.com. That's N-E-I-L-P-R-O-T-H-E-R-O-E.com. And my email contact is uh, is on the website if you wanted to get in touch. I'd be very, very pleased to have a chat with you um, and see where we go. Many thanks and have a great day. Bye-bye. And that's all it took for me to check out his work and agree for him to come onto the show. If you have something to say and you think that you want to reach out, even if you just want to ask a question, head over to thephotographyjunkie.com and the best ones will come on to the show. Anyway, join me now as I talk with Neil about his story. This is The Photography Junkie. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of The Photography Junkie. I'm your host, Jay, and on this episode, I speak to someone else who has decided to reach out to me. So if you think you have a story or you have a good work and would like to talk about it, head over to thephotographyjunkie.com, reach out, and you may well end up on an episode. So without further ado, let me welcome to the show, Neil Prothero. Hi, Jay. How are you doing? Not too bad. How are you? Very good. Very good. So uh, you decided to uh, reach out to me and, and leave a voice message. You're the first one to do that. And um, I have to ask, what made you do that? <laughs> well, I was um, listening to a recent uh, podcast that you did with Sarah Howard. Um, and Sarah is somebody I know very well. And I used to work with her a little bit uh, in the UK before I left to come and live in New Zealand. So um, I was particularly interested in that uh, episode and what she had to say, um, knowing that uh, I'd been on part of that journey with her uh, in her earlier career, as it were, in photography. So uh, I like the format and I like the idea. So I thought I'd give you a call and give the other half of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you're both uh, landscape photographers then? Yes. And... Um you do have sort of very different uh, styles from each other. Um, can you share any sort of memorable or challenging experience you've had while photographing a landscape or wildlife in New Zealand, which is uh, your home now? Yeah. Um, I think my uh, style has evolved over time. Sarah was a, a certainly an influence uh, for me because um I had previously been doing photography just for fun, really, and just as a as a hobby. Uh, but I suppose looking back, I was always drawn to landscapes and particularly travel because I was been lucky enough to travel in my life, and I always took a camera with, with me. But I've sort of refined my approach, and and I approach things much more methodically, um, or have done for, for for quite a few years now, which came from uh, Sarah's. Uh, tutelage and uh, her approach and I just kind of went from there so I think certainly we have we have different styles now um, 
but some of my you know some of my uh, previous work uh, some of the best that i did was was with her it just happened to be in the same place at the same time um but since since I've been living here in particular, um, the landscapes are very different. They're probably more dramatic than the UK landscapes, particularly on the South Island here, which is where I'm based. Uh, and I've always been drawn to mountains and blue alpine lakes and rivers and so on, and this sort of wilderness-type landscape rather than a colourful landscape. And so I've developed my style through that, I guess. Um, done a lot of exploring. Uh, by myself and with others, you know, driving up roads and gravel tracks to see what's at the end and see what magnificent vista is unfolding in front of our eyes and being able to photograph it. So uh, it's been a, uh, I, I certainly know what I enjoy the most. Um, and there are certain places which I can go back to time and time again and still get uh, every enjoyment out of it. So you're originally from the UK and um decided to uh to move to new zealand uh what what triggered that well that was really a question of um uh, i suppose disillusionment and frustration with the direction of travel in the uk as i saw it um i've been here for 12 years now and i think from anything everything i hear that uh, my my thoughts on what was happening have not been uh, too far from the mark in terms of um, certain in terms of my regrets because I have none. Uh, so it wasn't a new life as such. It was just creating new opportunities for my kids uh, and to um, change of environment, change of scene. Unfortunately, New Zealand's just a long way away. If it was uh, somewhere in the middle of, in the middle of the Atlantic, it'd be perfect. But it's just a long way away. That's the only disadvantage to being here. And and how have you found it? How how has it been being basically a, an outsider coming in uh, to? It's uh, New Zealand is a is a is a nation of immigrants. Um, it's got a very strong historical connection with the UK. Of course, it's a member of the Commonwealth, so the king is the head of state. Um, and so, generally speaking, it's been a very welcoming country. Um, We've had certainly no problems integrating here. It's a very easy country to assimilate into uh, because the the way of life is similar to the UK. The political system is the same. The um, the legal system is the same. They drive on the left side of the road and English is the common language, etc. So you're not having to push water uphill to settle here. It's all very familiar in that sense. And so it was. We've had no trouble at all. Um, and both my both my children have settled in really well. And are doing well for themselves um, in their own lives. And um, I just, I've just come back from Europe, actually. And whilst I thoroughly enjoy returning to get my sort of fix of culture and history and so on, uh, it's always nice to come back. It's just, uh, it's just a great place to be. And how did you, uh, how did you get into photography in the first place? Well, my dad used to work for Kodak when I was a very little boy um he was uh, not not actually in the photography division but in the chemicals uh, side of things and so um you know growing up in the 60s we always had a camera in the house and um so he was and he was a keen photographer himself just amateur, amateur hobbyist so he was encouraging of me and i think my first recollection probably was as a cub scout um and i and i got my photography badge you know the badges that your mum would sew onto the right, you know, onto the right <laughs> arm of your of your of your top. And I can remember even to this day we were in a in a, in a house in the village where where one of the local uh, residents offered his time uh, to teach photography to us young kids. And I used my dad's camera, which was a Kodak Retinet, all mechanical, no battery, no no meter, no nothing. It was all mechanical. And I learned everything on that. So the whole, um, you know, aperture, shutter speed, winding the film on, focusing with a, I think it's a 35 millimeter lens or maybe 40 millimeter lens, I forget. Um, that was all taught to me at the age of what, seven, seven or eight or something like that. And, and, and do you still of, remember the, uh, the Cub Scout motto? Oh, uh, be prepared, <laughs> be prepared. 
It's a very, it's very apt. It's very apt, you know. I, I, remember, in the field. I remember being a, a, a cub at a very young age, and um, off the top of my head, it was. Uh, I promise that I can, do, I will do my best to do my duty to God and to the Queen, and That's help it. one another and keep the Cub Scout law. Oh, <laughs> well done, well done. I, I don't know why that stuck in, but <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, no, I well, know that you say it. I'm reminded of it, but uh, yes, it was uh, no. It was very, um, yeah. That's what triggered my interest, and I've, I've really continued it ever since. I had uh, Instamatic cameras when they were the the rage, um, and the the first time I got into it really seriously was um, I was working in the states uh, in Florida in 1983. So I was what 21 or 22. And uh, there was a space shuttle being launched from Cape Canaveral, which was only about an hour away from where I was living and working. So I went to a camera store and I and I bought a camera uh, specifically for that shot. And I and this guy sold me a um, Konica FS1, which was I'd never heard of Konica, but at the time it was the first SLR to have a built-in motor drive. So for shooting multiple, you know, continuous shooting at whatever number of frames per second was perfect for the launch and, and of the space shuttle. And was that the one with the, the big sort of extension on the bottom for, for no, that motor no, drive? it was all built in. It was all built in to the, just to the hand grip on the right-hand side. So it was really quite, you know, it was quite technically advanced for its time. It sold me a Sigma 35 to 70 zoom lens, a zoom master lens. That was the combination. So my first use of that was for the shuttle, and it was awesome. Uh, it was before the Challenger disaster, so we were able to get quite close to the launch pad, relatively speaking. And I got some great shots, um, and that was the beginning of my uh, camera shopping spree, which lasted about 20 years, I guess, you know, uh, buying different models and as the technology improved or allegedly improved. And I went from Konica into Minolta um, for, what, 25 years, I think, probably, to Minolta cameras. And you mentioned your father encouraged you to pick up a, a camera at an early age. How do you think his influence uh, shaped your approach to photography? And are there any well, specific lessons or advice that, from him that you still hold dear? Um, looking back, um, I'm not sure I learned much in terms of approach to photography other than actually doing it and enjoying it and in, of course, it's all in the film days. It was all in the in the um, you know taking the pictures and sending the film off and having them come back and so on. Because when I went through my dad's uh, photographs um, after he passed away, yeah, a lot of them were just holiday snaps with very little creativity attached to them. It was just a record of what he had seen and visited on various uh, travels. There was one in particular which um, which I look for. Um, <clears throat> Uh, which is after 9-11, uh, because I know or I knew that he had a photograph in New York City of the Twin Towers when they were under construction. And I had one of, of my own of the Twin Towers in I don't know, 1993, I think it was, when I was uh, first there for the first time in a long time. And I wanted to um, put kind of three together of the towers under construction, one of them completed, which I took. And then I went back actually to New York in 2001 after the after they'd been destroyed. Um, and I wanted that sort of, you know, piece of history in three photographs, if you like. Uh, so that was quite poignant. But a lot of them, you know, frankly, were just holiday snaps and pretty meaningless. Um, I took my own photography to a different level in terms of creativity and getting out of bed early in the morning to photograph sunrises and season season colours and so on, which my dad was he was not really doing that much of. It was more just recreational hobby. Um, so I think he'd be pretty happy with what I've been able to produce over the years with the opportunities that I've had. Um, so I've sort of I've taken his encouragement and just made the best use of it. And. Um... So you've gone, a lot of people go down the, the portrait route. You've chosen to go down the, the more, the landscape route. Um, mm -hmm. what, what was the driving factor in, in terms of that, that choice? Uh, undoubtedly travel. Um, when I was, uh, after I bought my first uh, digital 
SLR. I actually went on a on, on a workshop with Sarah at Western Arboretum in Gloucestershire, because at the time, although I knew how to take pictures, um, I had I didn't know the difference between a, a JPEG and the hole in the ground. Quite frankly, this is all new terminology for me, so I had to kind of learn the digital workflow, if you like. Which um, which so that was a great day well spent. I've uh, got some really nice pictures as well, which is an added bonus. And I think later that year, no, it would have been the following year, I think it was, um, we went as a family to Tanzania uh, for a wildlife safari holiday type thing. And I was determined to sort of go there with my digital camera and know, kind of know what I was doing with it to, you know, to make the most of that opportunity. And um, I've always been a traveler, so you know, traveling to different places. I spent a lot of time in the U.S., uh, a lot of time in various European countries, and it's always the the landscapes which have appealed to me. So it was a natural thing, really, to uh, just get better at doing that um, rather than – I've never been interested, really, in photographing people in the sense of weddings. I took you know, 3,000 pictures of my firstborn and 250 of my secondborn. I think that's quite a common tale amongst people who have children. <laughs> um, I, but I'm other kind than of the that, same you know, with my dog. <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's uh, you know it's just it's, it's uh, the excitement of it all and then so i've, I've photographed my kids then family holidays and of course to me all that's faded into the distance a little bit because of course iphones and so on have replaced point and shoot cameras and simple photography um so i tend to use my phone or a, or a small camera for traveling for 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 leisure for uh, holiday um, and keep the proper camera for proper photography wherever it may be so as as a, a fully self-confessed nerd um i'm quite excited to hear about the uh, the opportunity to shoot the shuttle uh taking off are you able to mm -hmm. sort of dive into that experience a little bit more oh well it was um first of all the ability to have you know to shoot two or three frames uh, continuously it was just brand new to me and the guy in the shop said oh you know this would be perfect and just better keep it keep it uh, keep it in frame and as it goes up you just tilt the camera up so i got a sequence of probably i don't know maybe six or seven shots as it was leaving the, the launch pad uh, probably in program mode dare i say it um because i can't i don't think i was working in manual mode at all at that time in my career um and i i don't have the prints anymore sadly um but i i did have them for a long time and they were you know they were great they were sh they were sharp and and i think um you had us all that yeah we were, i think we were about four miles away you can't get closer than about 10 miles now but i think we were about four miles away as a group just on the road near cape canaveral so we're pretty close and, and, and the same at that sort of distance. oh my god uh, the ground rumbles beneath your feet. It's like a freight train coming behind you. It's incredible. Um, uh, it's quite an ex quite very moving experience, to be honest with you. A very emotional experience to see that thing go up. And of course, you can see it disappearing into the sky. It's a daytime launch uh, until it goes out of sight after a, I don't know, a minute or two. And they just smoke plumes behind it. Quite quite incredible. And do you know do you know what launch it was or, or what vehicle? It was, I believe, oh, I did make a note of it. I think it was, um, I forget, it wasn't Challenger. It was, um, Columbia? I think it was Discovery. Discovery. It might have been Columbia. Like it was in April. Oh, I had it written down. I did make a note. Um, I don't remember, to be honest with you. But it was a daytime, daytime launch in summer. So it's... And there was a nighttime there was a nighttime launch uh, later on that summer as well, which we could see from Orlando, where I lived, um, and I captured that as well. Uh, just this orange, orange blob in the sky, uh, but the the light from that, I was able to capture that on a, on a four hundred ASA film from a distance of sixty miles. No detail, of course, but but lit up. And, the first and have you uh, been that. tempted to? With you being in New Zealand, have you been tempted to uh, go down and and capture the? Uh the electron launches i haven't done because they're on the north island um they're up on uh, on hawks bay so i see them i see plenty of pictures of them um uh, you know online afterwards but i haven't been up there to do it uh, but the other thing we had here was in from based out of christchurch was uh, the american sophia program which was the converted boeing 747 which was doing night photography 
plotting the plotting the shadows cast by stars on the Antarctic ice, would you believe? Uh, quite extraordinary um, science. And uh, two of the program directors actually stayed at my place uh, like a few years ago because uh, I think they've pulled out now for a while. Um, just fascinating, you know, fascinating stuff that they do. So your your journey from the UK to New Zealand is uh, quite intriguing. Uh, how has this move to a new country influenced your photography? Well, we're blessed here with uh, amazing landscapes. Um, it's a very beautiful country. And whilst we don't have the the biggest or the longest or the deepest of anything, we do have an extraordinary diversity of landscapes in a very relatively small geographic area. And so you can be, you know, you can photograph the sunrise on a mountain peak or a glacier in the morning, and you can be doing sunset on a sandy beach uh, and, uh, in the evening, having passed through a rainforest during the afternoon. You know, it's, it's that it's that small and that, that accessible. So there's no shortage of material, and it's a very beautiful landscape. It's um, in parts it's rugged. It's not particularly colourful. It's very green here, green, green, grey, and brown. Uh, but it's dramatic, and uh, we have a, a little bit of everything. That's what makes it so appealing. So it's um, whereas I think you know in the UK I've been I've spent time in Dorset, in South Wales, in the Lake District. Um, uh, not much in Scotland, um, but it, you're so you know you have to travel so far to get to those pockets of isolated beauty. Whereas here it's just all every round every corner. Uh, it just seems to be so much easier to get to uh, in that way. And so I'm, having I'm right in thinking that uh, New Zealand is uh, quite common with the UK in that there's not much in a way of sort of venomous animals that are right together. There's none. There are none. Yeah, no uh, four-legged predators. You can walk in the bush in your bare feet here without fear of uh, being bitten or attacked or stung or anything. It's amazing. I, I suppose that makes a, a difference in, in knowing that um, from a safety point of view, you maybe even opens up more options in terms of what you would uh, attempt to do. Yeah, it does. Uh, but it comes with a warning because there are a lot of people, you know, every year there are people who get caught out with um, being unprepared or ill-prepared for walking some of the mountain tracks and some of the backcountry um, back hiking trails, for example, because the weather can turn... Um, in the blink of an eye, and what starts off as a nice, perfectly pleasant day can turn into something quite nasty by the afternoon. There's stories every year of helicopters having to go in to rescue people and people have got stranded and lost in the backcountry. It's it's not to be taken lightly, and I'm, I'm acutely aware when I'm, even if I'm driving out in places that, um, you know, those fords which we can easily cross in a 4 by 4 vehicle could become torrents uh, of water in it after a heavy rainstorm, so you've, you've got to be you've got to be aware and not get complacent about where you're going. Um, and it's uh, it's fair to say that uh, landscape and wildlife photography often require a, a deep understanding of the environment. Um, can mm -hmm. you share some tips or some strategies for photographers looking to capture the beauty of uh, of nature effectively? Well, I think uh, we always. Um, take heed of the weather forecast for one that's a kind of a, an obvious one but um it's interesting when you go to some of the glaciers here which uh they're actually less accessible now than they were a few years ago actually as a result of severe weather um but the warning boards at the at the sort of trailheads going to the glaciers warn you that uh things can change in the blink of an eye that um, rivers can flood very, very quickly. Uh, just be wary of your surroundings. You could get cut off. Don't leave the trails and paths. The warning signs are there for a reason. The fences are there for a reason. Um, and I, I get very um, nervous when I see people flouting the rules because they're just asking for trouble, frankly. And uh, we're just, you know, just acutely aware of that. Um, and particularly if we're going to hike any distance into the uh, into the hills. And you have you ever been uh, caught out yourself? Not really. Um, certainly nothing major. Um, 
that I can recall. Um, I suppose we do the right thing and just we are cautious. Um, but that said, I was uh, I was uh, living in a place called Kaikoura um, uh, seven years ago, eight years ago, when we had uh, a massive earthquake, which is not something you can really prepare for or plan for. Uh, and that was a bit of an eye opener because uh, everybody's lives changed overnight. And it was actually at night, so it's not something we're able to sort of go out and photograph and take silly risks. But um, uh, the following day, we certainly did. And um, again, you have to, you know, I was walking up, walking up what is the main highway. It was completely closed off to traffic because of big slips and so on. And um, walking through tunnels, you know, rail tunnels was actually ill-advised with hindsight because they could have just collapsed on us. Um, you, just can't, you just can't be complacent about this sort of thing. It's the power of nature, which you should never underestimate. And, and what happened on that event? Well, it was a huge 7.8 earthquake in the middle of the night, and the epicenter was um, maybe 30 miles from where, from where we lived, but it was uh, two minutes of uh, tremendous ground shaking. Um threw me out of bed it was say it was midnight literally threw me out of bed onto the floor and um you know all the power goes out we were without water for a couple of weeks and and uh, the whole town was cut off north and south there's only two roads in uh, and two roads in and one road out and they're all cut off with huge slips we had the navy delivering food to us for a week and uh, all that kind of thing um it was yeah it was a life-changing experience not something i'd wish on anybody fortunately very few people were uh, injured there's two two deaths uh, one was a direct result uh, of a house collapse and the other was a heart attack probably the shock of the whole thing and you said um went out the next day and, and took pictures the next day mm. um as somebody that shoots landscapes in general how did that influence the the sort of pictures that you took? Well, the, I did one uh, which was uh, an aftershock, which I could see from my back garden actually at home, and I heard this rumbling in the mountains behind. And I grabbed my camera, and um, what actually what I was witnessing was the shearing off of a massive chunk of the mountain, and it came cascading down the, down the mountainside, and it created this huge plume of smoke and you could smell it in the air it was like a cordite smell in the air almost like a gunpowder smell and of course the sound the sound uh, travels at a different speed to the actual event so it's one of those situations where the sound followed afterwards and i did capture it on camera it's a bit of an overcast day and it was a photo which i offered uh, to to people in the town just as a kind of a souvenir of the event if that's not too macabre way of expressing it but it also went quite viral on the news channels uh because the the rockfall created a dam of the river up in high up in the mountains, uh, which in turn created an artificial lake, uh, literally overnight. This is what happens. And I, you know, I was, I thought I've, I've captured a sort of moment of natural history here. It was only because I happened to be there with a camera on hand and I managed to fire off a couple of shots. So a news crew came up a few days later because there were one or two rumblings in the, with the engineers at the local council concerned that this this temporary dam might give way and this huge volume of water would come cascading down the mountainside and so on. So where I, and I was in, I was interviewed by some uh, some TV and radio journalists about this picture, which had gone viral on the internet, and. Uh, I was all kind of prepared to talk about this amazing moment of capturing a moment of natural history and, and, and landscape changing, you know, in front of our eyes and this kind of thing. And all they were interested in was talking about oh, how many people live in the vicinity of this river when it gives way and they're going to get swept away to their deaths, you know, it's all that sort of uh, sensational um, angle on the story. So it's, it was quite funny, but um, not what I wanted to talk about. But it was a it was a moment in time, and um, one of the few pictures actually of the, of this sort of earthquake sequence because these things you know they rumble on for days and days uh, because the original uh, quake was in the middle of the night, so no photo, no photos at all of um, anything going on at that time. And a bit what, of journalistic photography. What then happened with the uh, with the lake after that? 
it did burst in the end. Um, it grew to, a, I think it was about 750 meters long. Uh, so it's quite a big, you know, quite a big dam and quite a big lake. And helicopters would take people up there as, um, you know, one of the newest attractions. It was uh, just something that wasn't there last year and so on. But it gave way eventually, but it didn't cause the huge cascade of water that everybody had um, been, been concerned about. It was more of a gradual seepage, which just eventually gave way. So it's not there anymore. Just, just gone. So nature's gone full course. But you can still see the scarring on the mountainside if you were familiar with it before uh, and afterwards. You can still see that today where that rock was just literally sheared off. Huge chunk. And have you uh, gone to the to the site itself and, and photographed or...? I haven't, no, because it's kind of where you, where I photographed it from. It's you know it's, these are eight thousand feet peaks, so by the time you get up there, it's kind of unrecognisable from that from that point of view. And I never actually went up to to photograph the lake. I would have liked to have done that, but I just just didn't get around to doing it before it disappeared. Because so you mentioned uh, earlier about uh, taking your photography more serious with the advent of. Uh, digital photography how did this transition impact your creative process and your ability well, to connect with your audience uh that's exactly what what it what it was it was um the ability i think to uh not only share my own photography but more importantly was to was the ability to see other people's photography and i can remember you know flicker uh, I, I joined up with Flickr um, ages and ages ago, and I found that photography community to be really, really good. Um, you could send a message to somebody and say, "Oh, you know, where did you where did you shoot that photo from?" I used it a lot for reference and for um, sort of scouting and location research and so on. And on the whole, people were very helpful and friendly and said, "Oh, you know, I went up there and there's a track off to the left, and you'll see it." Sort of, you know, that sort of helpful hints rather than keeping it all secret. Um, and particularly in spots around New Zealand, which I wasn't necessarily familiar with back then. Uh, so it was that ability just to just to communicate with and integrate into the photographic community, which prior to the internet and being able to upload all this stuff was, you know, how do you do it? You'd have to it would be through camera clubs, I guess, locally. You wouldn't have that sort of you know, global um connection and there was another there was another good instance actually uh, which which comes to mind i, I took a shot uh, as in it was somewhere in uh, montana in the states it was a slide film that i used and at the time i was converting slides to digital uh, files with a view to doing a, a little you know photo book um as you did and um i got this picture and it was a a, a what you call a two horse town um and i couldn't remember where it was and i couldn't for the life of me i looked at maps and i was saying no no and i went on to google earth and i couldn't find it on there and or at least i thought i couldn't find it so i went on to Flickr to a montana small towns montana Flickr group or something and i posted the picture up and i said can anybody help me and identify which town this is and i got about 12 people responding within half an hour and say oh that's uh whatever it was called, du, Dupuy, Dupuy New, uh, Montana, I think is how it's pronounced. And um, straight away, you know, people just being very helpful. So that that was enabled me to caption my picture in my little book. And all I can remember about it uh, was this big sweeping bend and this old Texaco fuel station with the 1950s Texaco logo still being used on the sign. You know, it was just one of those really remote cowboy towns, which um, – you stumble across. So that made my day. And it was just making a connection with somebody the other side of the world or you know, across the Atlantic um, who was able to help me out all for free and out of the goodness of their heart. And that that connection of people or connection with people rather, um, that would, would you say that that uh, is uh, one of the reasons how you got into doing your workshops and, and tours? Very much. I mean, I, I've actually spent most of my life in hospitality, uh, restaurants and hotels and pubs and things. So I'm, you know, dealing with people and looking after people. It's kind of in my blood um, in, that, in that regard. So I'm running workshops and tours is ultimately about looking after people and uh, making sure that everything runs properly from a logistical point of view, that they're having a good time from an enjoyment point of view. 
and uh, obviously then doing my job to help um, with their photography, which is what they've come for in the first place. So it is very much about um, connection and uh, being able to um, just being able to relate to people from all walks of life uh, and to and to just you know be able to share those experiences, I guess. And I've I've been doing it for so long. In whether you're running a bar or a restaurant or a photo workshop, uh, if you like, the technology is different, but the the process is exactly the same. And operating photography tours and workshops is uh, a unique aspect of your career. Uh, could you mm-hmm. elaborate on the most rewarding aspects of uh, teaching others about photography and the natural world? Well, for me, there's no doubt. I mean, I get a tremendous sense uh, of satisfaction when when the light bulb moment is realized, uh, when people make a breakthrough in their own learning. And uh, nothing gives me more joy is when someone, oh, that's how you, oh, I see, that's how you do it. Oh, that's what that's for. And when people say that, then, you know, and all of a sudden it opens doors for them. And um, if I've managed to explain it in a way which is understandable and gives them that confidence, then it's job done. And that, I get a lot of reward from that. Uh, so it doesn't matter at what level. Um, I, uh, I'm, as, I'm as happy uh, as I've most showing someone uh, just a couple of uh, was it yes uh, day before yesterday i'm just getting to grips with his camera um and getting him a little bit more confident in its in its basic use nothing terribly complicated just getting its basic the basic competence in using the camera competence and confidence uh, the next couple of days time i'm seeing someone who needs desperate needs help sorting out his lightroom photo library which is all over the place and just needs some help and guidance in putting all that back together in a way which will work and that'll be a light bulb moment when he when he sees how that's done i'm sure uh and then i'm with um i've got an american guest coming over next week for a week uh who i'm showing around the south part of the south island and so that's more of a tour if you like he's a competent photographer so as i understand it so with him, it's a case of taking him to the right places at the right time, and that's my local knowledge, which will will drive that process, which is something I've acquired over the years. Um, that'll be interesting because Queenstown, which is our resort town on the southwest of the South Island, that's had some real severe weather the last couple of days with floods and landslips. So that's going to be an interesting challenge to go into on Wednesday morning because um, it's it uh, may interrupt uh, what our plans were and may force us to change what we do but we'll see and with your with your work itself uh with some landscape photographers go on the rely quite heavily on the post-processing side of things to, to bring out the aspects some people prefer it uh basically done right in camera whereabouts on the, mm-hmm. the, the scale well i'm very much um I, my my approach to photography is very much a technical one. I guess that comes from my film upbringing. Uh, so I'm very keen to get as much uh, as possible uh, done in camera, uh, certainly in terms of exposure and focus and um, depth of field, et cetera, get all of that um, uh, done in camera as best we can. And then post-processing afterwards, as uh, I'm, I, I mean, I'm a fan of of high contrast and and punchy colors. That's not to say saturated colors, but just color contrasts. And I use selective um, adjustments in Lightroom with a tone curve and um, HSL color selections uh, for most of my editing. Uh, very few global edits. Uh, and I try just to give pictures a little punch rather than have them all, you know, glowing, saturated, and and very vibrant. Uh, but I prefer to go that side of the scale than than the sort of paler, more pastel approach. But uh, if I've done my job right, and of course lighting conditions, etc., play a huge part in that, um, which you can't do much about, then post processing is to the uh, is a minimum really. Um, I have a workflow which I I have learned over the years, um, influenced by one or two people, and I stick to that, and I'm I'm pretty happy with it. And are you one for HDR, or is that not your? No, I did um, in the early days when camera sensors were not quite so um, powerful. 
sort of ten years ago, twelve years ago, I did I did HDR work. If I do it now, it's more for um, creative effect in terms of you know movement of leaves and trees and that type of thing. Um, or if I want to bring out um, real, real detail in in a, in a particular scene. But generally, uh, no, I've moved on from HDR. What um, about um, expanding the shot where you, um, for people that are not familiar, where you take multiple images uh, and stitch them for that large area? I do, yes. I do um, panoramic stitching. Um, I guess that's a bit more and more these days because there's so many scenes in New Zealand which lend which lend themselves to panoramas. Um, I think I'd, what I'd like to do is get into the discipline of doing single shots, panoramas, and portrait orientation of the same scene every time. That's something I'd, I'd like to challenge myself with going forward. Uh, my colleague does that as a matter of course. Um, that's that's her uh, approach. And um, I come away thinking, oh, I wish I'd done a panorama of that particular scene. And it's not a question of not seeing it particularly. It's just more I'm getting more hung up on getting my single frame spot on, uh, particularly something like a waterfall where it's going to take multiple attempts till I get the effect that I want. Um, and, of course, then I forget about doing the panorama, which could be quite easily done at the end and, you know, no, no, no extra work. But it's just a discipline, I guess, I've got to get into. But I do do it, especially now that Lightroom is capable of stitching so well. Um, I don't really want to complicate my life with too many extra programs and add-ins and plugins, plugins. Um, but Lightroom does a great job. So where a panorama is called for, uh, I will do it, um, whether handheld or or on a tripod. So not specifically a a panorama style of thing. Um, for me, for my fine art stuff that I do. Uh, I quite like putting small figures in big environments. Um, so one of the, the techniques that I'll use is actually have uh, massive amounts of resolution basically in a photo by uh, doing vertical and and just right. literally ex expanding the, the shot. So I end up with like a 28 gigabyte image in in seven cases yeah. uh you ever sort of expand it that way or is it just more i haven't that... really no i haven't um uh there's a couple where i've done yeah i've not really done i've not really done it and i suppose it kind of again it comes back to i tend to photograph what i see um and capture the scene as i see it i have no interest for example in swapping out a gray sky for a blue one or anything. I just, I just, I have no interest in doing it at all. If it's not the right sky on the day, I'll walk away and I'll go back another day or I'll just put up with it as it is. Um, so I guess it's more a case of, you know, this is it as I see it. This is the conditions that we're in, which sometimes can be just amazing. You're jumping for joy with what you've come across and other times where well, it's a bit disappointing, but it is what it is. Uh, and I know it's not something that's going to end up on the wall, but I'll photograph it anyway because I've come all the way here and I've got my camera, so I'll do it. Um, there's another example of that just a few days ago, which is a nice scene, but the light was not right. So it's one, but it's one I will go back to another day um, when it's uh, perhaps better and more favourable, and I'll get a good shot there because it's a nice little scene to photograph. And that's my approach, really. Uh, I don't go, I don't go much beyond that. And with the with the new tools and everything that's coming out what are your thoughts on ai i know it can be quite a controversial subject for some yeah, people I'm, for me uh, i'm not at all perturbed by it i think there'll always be a place for creative photography because um, my enjoyment is is in it's not just about making the picture and seeing the result it's actually about the experience of being there um, particularly with a beautiful landscape scene or, um, you know, a beautiful sunrise or a stunning sunset or even a night sky for that matter. Uh, being there in the moment is a big part of it. And it's the backstory to a, to a good image, to a successful image. As indeed, I mean, I was in the Camargue in June in south of France photographing the white horses down there. And uh, that was a great experience, you know, just having those powerful animals running towards you at full tilt in water and just being able to photograph them. Uh, nothing can substitute for that memory and that experience. My only concern with it really is, is the abuse of copyright that's going to result in people stealing 
uh, imagery, photographic um, content from all sorts of places and using it to promote their own so-called art. And I think that's I think that's going to be a very complex and concerning area. Um, and questions are being asked already about, well, what if I, you know, what if this happens, or what if someone did that? That does concern me a bit. It's a bit of a, a minefield, I think, coming up. But as a photographer, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. It's just another little advance in technology, which each to their own. It's digital art. Um, I'm a photographer. I'm not a digital artist. And how do you strike the balance uh, between preserving the natural beauty you photograph and sharing it with the world? In what in what sense? So the um, the, there's that thing where you share something special with somebody, and it promotes lots of other people going to that location. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I'm not too, there's a few little secret spots that I know of, which if somebody asks me where they are, I've got no hesitation in, you know, helping them find them and so on. Uh, cause some of them probably helped me to find them in the first place. I'm not, uh, I'm not an adventurer discovering new places. Um, I do worry sometimes about some of the popular Instagram spots as they've become known where they're just, and I think what depresses me that in those places is just people getting pictures, mostly selfies, which will never see the light of day. They'll stay on people's phones or at very best end up on a social media site or something like Instagram. And you think, well, what's, you know, what's all that about? And it, and some places are um, being spoiled as a result of that. An example of that, for example, is the, uh, the lavender fields in the south of France, uh, which is where I was touring in June. Uh, some of the uh, some of the lavender farmers have closed their properties off. There's signs up, you know, no entry, private property, etc. And some have even taken their lavender fields, um, taken the lavender out and replaced it with corn because they're just sick and tired of people trampling the trampling the plants to get those selfies. And you can't help but have sympathy with them for that because it's just a it's just a selfish abuse, really. And that's a bit annoying because it spoils it for everybody. It's the same here in New Zealand. We've got um, uh, one of the popular subjects at the end of November, December is the lupins, the spring lupins, especially in the high country. And uh, unless you get there in the early part of the lupin season, which is only a month long, um, the chances are you're going to find the fields trampled, you know, with people, by people who just go in there with their phones and just want to do a selfie amongst the colourful flowers and don't give a damn about the destruction they leave behind. And that's just, I think it's just a blight of modern tourism, to be honest with you. I don't think we can do much about it as photographers. I don't necessarily buy the argument that we're part of the problem because we can be very respectful where we go. It's sort of one of those, you know, what is it? Uh, take only pictures and leave only footprints. So that's, that old adage is still very true today, but fewer people are respecting it, seems to me. And it, while it's not something that really comes up in the UK, being in somewhere like New Zealand, which is rich in a, a sort of a cultural and tribal uh, traditions. Are there any ethical considerations or practices that you follow as a landscape photographer? Yeah, very much. You have to, I mean, there's, um, you have to be very sensitive to um, uh, historical sites, um, sites of religious significance uh, and historical significance to Māori. Uh, there are certain places which are um, sacred to Māori and, in fact, are owned by Māori. They, they preside over them. And sometimes you have to have special permissions to go on to photograph them. In general, it's a very cooperative environment and it's like everything. A little bit of respect goes a long way. Uh, you're going to be met with a much kinder and more and warmer welcome if you actually go and knock on someone's door and ask rather than just assuming and turning up and then finding you've got someone, um, uh, you know, shouting at you saying, excuse me, what are you doing? So we have to be aware of that. Uh, there's not too many places where we're affected by it, but um, we are aware of it. And when we, when that is, is part of the, uh, that's part of the process. So I suppose that, uh, that New Zealand would be one of the, exceptions to the rule of the uh, the old photographer adage of uh, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission 
<laughs> yes, I think that's probably true. Yes, yes. So uh, but most can... again, you know, Carry on. I was going to say most most people. If you if you if you ask, you know, would you mind if I take a picture of this, or would you mind if I you know climb over the fence? And that they're going to say, yeah, absolutely. And as indeed they were in France this year. You know, we approached a couple of lavender farmers whose property is marked as private. Ask permission. Um, you know, would you mind if we came up early one morning and just shot shot from this position here? No problem at all. Um, we're happy that you've taken the trouble and shown the respect to ask them. It's it's the others they don't like. <laughs> <laughs> and can you sort of provide insights into your creative process when selecting which landscapes or wildlife to photograph, and how you approach composing your shots? Uh, to convey your artistic vision. Um, sure, I'm. Um, I love mountains, rivers, lakes. I'm an absolute sucker for S curves in the landscape. I always seek out curves um, and leading lines and that sort of thing. It's I, I, I go in search of them for um, particularly mountain environments. This lends itself. I'm. Um, uh, I do tend to follow the rules, I think, the sort of unwritten rules of photography. Um, I'm not a great fan of uh, prominent foregrounds, like, you know, sort of wildflowers and so on in, in, in the immediate foreground with a mountain somewhere in the distance. It's just not my style. I, I admire the work when I see it, but it's just not something that I particularly enjoy doing myself. I, I prefer more dramatic uh, bigger landscape scenes than that, uh, personally. And um, colour is an important thing. You know, colour in the sky for sunrise. We've had some absolutely magnificent sunrises just by chance. Sometimes on the last day, after three or four days of solid rain, it's been fantastic, and you just you know just revel in that moment. And there was one one occasion. There's a shot down in uh, Fiordland in a town called Teano which is one of the wettest places on earth, in fact. And we were there for four days, solid rain, day and night. And on the morning of the last day, we got a break in the weather and we had this beautiful orange sunrise cloud. Uh, everything was calm. There were reflections in the lake. And uh, because of the bad weather, the snow had fallen. It was actually early snow that, that year. And I came away with a wonderful shot. It's still one of my favorites and uh, one of my most successful and of course, the backstory to it, to, for me, uh, not everybody has to know the backstory, but for me, it made it very special because it was, my patience paid off. Uh, the conditions in the end, you know, you could go back there a hundred times and not got, not get those conditions again. And uh, the, the the composition was just right up my alley. You know, it was um, a telephoto. I'm a big fan of telephoto in the landscape and the compression effect that it gives. It's one of my one of my things. Uh, and it had everything. And uh, this guy came away with a great picture, hugely rewarding. I've got 25 copies of that backed up just in case. <laughs> so the um, you've been uh, somebody that's uh, been an amateur and a professional photographer. Uh, what advice would you give to individuals looking to turn their passion for, passion for photography into a full-time career? Um, I've been very fortunate. Um, I've met some some people along the way uh, who have helped me in my in my career and have, have been a great influence on me. And in some cases, I've had a lucky break. But I've I've a couple of principles which I've adhered to. One is to always run your own race. Um, don't try to compete with other people or compare yourself to other people. Just run your own race and stay in your own lane. Uh, do it primarily for your enjoyment. Um, and practice, 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 and just, but you, you do have to make the effort to get out there at the right times of day and, and just put a little bit more effort into planning, planning what you're going to do, because the chances of actually stumbling across something amazing are probably quite slim. You need to make your own luck. And I'll give an example of that, actually, and this goes back uh, 12 years ago, and funnily enough, was with uh, Sarah when we were researching a, a workshop she was running up in the Lake District. We turned up at, um, it was a November evening, and we turned up maybe, I don't know, half an hour before sunset or something, uh, to a jetty at Coniston Water. And uh, there had been a, there was a guy there, he must have been there for a couple of hours, I reckon, 
And it was a pretty dull day. And come sunset, he just packed up his bag and said, right, I'm out of here. Um, nice to meet you. And off he went. And we stayed behind. And about 15, 20 minutes later, the sky began to clear. The um, twilight was a very rich pink. The, the lake was absolutely calm, flat calm. And we ended up with a wonderful um, sort of twilight sunset scene of Coniston Water Jetty, um, which we were able to photograph quite peacefully for five or ten minutes uh, as, the, as the light faded. And that picture ended up, for my, my version of it, ended up on the back page of the Daily Telegraph a couple of months later. I put it in for a um, you know, shot of the day type thing, whatever it was called. And it was you know, proof, if ever it was needed, that patience is a virtue. And just don't give up when it's, you know, there's something may still happen. And that's something which has stuck with me forever. And it's also paid dividends once or twice since as well. Um, uh, just Just holding back. Temptation is to pack up and go home and you know have a nice cup of tea or a beer or something, but just waiting 20 minutes can make all the difference. And it's just just that patience and it'll pay. And what what challenges do you face when capturing the uh, the unique landscapes in, in New Zealand? Um and how have you sort of overcome them? Well, one of the one of the great advantages we have here is that you can go to so many places where there is practically nothing man-made to be seen. So your canvas and your your sort of you know your your, your uh, what do they call it your your yeah, your blank canvas is great to start. So we don't have uh, huge things to avoid or, um, uh, or or have to go to go to places or even not go to places because of you know you can't avoid things. Um, so it's to that extent it's uh, easier weather is the biggest is the biggest challenge here um weather and especially in the mountains you know it's it's either all or nothing sometimes you can have totally clear clear skies cloudless skies uh, or they can be so cloudy you can't see a hand in front of you and they're, they're finding the happy medium where you have the views the mountain peaks on show but with some cloud in the sky that is something you do have to wait for and I've learned again, I'll just get it while I can and make the best of it while I can. Um, sometimes it makes for a great picture. Other times I think, oh, I wish it was just, you know, just a little bit better. Uh, and I'll try again next time. There's one particular scene um, which I take my clients to, which is a spot on the West Coast called Lake Matheson. And it's quite a famous view of Mount Cook and Mount Tasman reflecting in a kettle lake uh, not far from the coast. And for that scene to work properly, you need totally calm day, no wind at all. The lake itself um, has uh, it's, it's very tannin rich, and that gives it a great reflecting properties. So the mountains reflect, mirror reflect in this lake on a calm morning. But to get the great picture, the sort of postcard picture, um, the sky needs to be clear, or at least the clouds need to be. Um, uh, high enough or sparse enough that you can see the mountains. So I've got some great shots from there. I've had very few disappointments. It's been pretty good to me over the years. But the one that I'm missing is a one where the cloud is low hanging below the mountain peaks and just and, and also reflecting in the lake. That's my that's my grail shot for that location. And I shall keep going back there uh, until I get it because it's one that I really, really want. And I know it's possible. Uh, it's, I tend to prefer sunrise there than sunset. That's my personal preference. And sunrise is probably the best time to get that, uh, that low-hanging cloud. Uh, and I'll just keep going back because it's a shot that I want. And if my clients are happy in the meantime with clear skies and getting that perfect reflection, that's great. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't shoot it again. I've got the picture I want with a clear sky, just missing that one from my little library. And your photography encompasses both fine art work and also digital licensing for commercial use. Mm -hmm. uh, how mm -hmm. do you decide which images are best suited for each purposes and what considerations go into pricing your work? Well, what I do is I tend to, um, I mean, it, anything, pretty much anything is available for commercial use. And I've, I've had examples for, um, of uh, 
tourist organizations looking for an image of a particular location or a particular feature. Certainly, for example, braided rivers. I've, I've got a little library of braided rivers, which are photographed from above from an open door helicopter. Um, so if and I, uh, the requests I get are, are to the effect of, you know, do you have any photos of braided rivers or do you have a photo of Mount Cook with, uh, with the river in front of it or what have you, that type of request or Lake Matheson, for example. And I can say, yes, I do. And then it depends on the organization. If it's a, um, there's, I think one of the ones I, I, I sold a license to recently was an organization called Forest and Bird. And they are leading conservation. It's a leading conservation group in New Zealand, um, advocating for preservation of our woodlands and rainforests, and also um, bird life in the country. And they, you know, it's a membership. It's a bit like um, it's, a, it's a membership organisation. I can't know what it's called in the UK. Uh, they produce magazines and fundraising and um, so on uh, throughout the year. So I would typically. Uh, the license, depending on what the use is for, it may be the cost of a large print, as simple as that, which they can use for their own publication, for a maybe for a campaign or for a magazine um, print, for example. If it's something for uh, on a on a perpetual license basis, um, I did some for in a company called Inter Islander who run the ferries between the North and South Island. They approached me. Uh, some time ago for a picture I did just in the spur of the moment of one of their ferries in the, in the Marlborough Sounds, which worked out quite well. Um, and they wanted to use that in their um, marketing activity. So I sold it to them for just an agreed fee. Um, it's not a picture I was going to do anything with. It's just one that sat in my library. So I can be you know reasonably generous as far as that's concerned. If it's a photo that um, I'm going to make use of myself, and sell them, it's going to be a more expensive proposition for someone wanting to use it because I'm actually uh, distributing it outside of my own control to that extent. So I tend not to be, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not selling these things for thousands upon thousands of dollars, but um, certainly a four figure uh, number for a license like that is something I'd always try to attain. And how, how far do you go in, in sort of protecting that copyright? I'm absolutely um, determined to protect copyright. I do a lot of, uh, spend a lot of time doing reverse image searches on Google um, to see if anybody's using some of my more uh, popular or widely published images for, for any purpose that has not been authorized. And it's quite amazing how many, how many times you come across it. And quite amazing how many organizations have been pinching images. Um, sometimes given the benefit of the doubt uh, inadvertently. But there was one um, couple of years ago I stumbled across. It was a kind of a life counselor um, website in the U.S. And the owner of this life counseling business, she had two of my pictures and two of another well-known New Zealand photographer, um, just, you know, just landscape scenes which have been published on um, various on, on a website may even have been as simple as Facebook, and the cheek of it, and my the one of the images she used of mine still had my watermark on it, and this is being promoted on this is being used on her website. So I got in touch with her and I said, I'm sorry, but you know you can't do that. Uh, you don't have a permission or a license for that. So I'm, you know I can certainly offer to you know to to give you one uh, to 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 let you have one. But uh, oh, she said, you know, it's, you have to talk to my web designer. And I said, well, no, it's not your web designer. It's you. You know, you're using it. You'll have to talk to your web designer. So she ended up taking it down. And the other photographer who I referred to uh, was totally unaware of this. And uh, so he he was very grateful for bringing it to his attention because we don't mind the work being our uh, work being used. I mean, that's you know, part of the reason we do it. But it's got to be done legally and and properly. So I'm I'm. Pretty active in that uh, in that uh, regard, and I will contact anybody who's using my pictures without my permission or without permission given by someone I've given permission to. For example, I've come across a few uh, in the tourism industry in China, which is very difficult because all of the narrative around the picture is in Chinese, and I, oh, you know, it's just just almost impossible to try to control that. So I just have to let it go. Uh, but if I can, I will I will take action. And do you ever use services like uh, I use, for example, Pixie 
to to go out and and search for those images? I haven't done. I've done it myself um, because I kind of know which which of my images have been published. Um, when I say published, I mean uploaded as well as used anywhere else. And it's it's very often um, an image which is published, for example, in an online newspaper. That's when it starts to get difficult because that can then be downloaded by anybody from that online newspaper. You start to lose control over over where it goes. And there was a situation a few years ago it was an Australian newspaper based out of Sydney who were they were writing a, an article, a travel article about Kaikoura, which is where I used to live. Um, and one of the images they used was one which had been supplied to them by Kaikoura Tourism, of which I was a board member at the time. But then it starts to appear in other publications, um, which may be linked to that original newspaper. There's just, just a spider's web. And uh, you have to you have to make your own mind up as to how much time you're going to spend pursuing this kind of stuff. But it just goes to show how how difficult it can be to control once something is out there uh, on the internet. Yeah, that's that's why I, I like to use um, Pixie myself. So they they go out and they hunt for it, and basically they handle all the the takedowns and even the court processes. I usually get a, yeah. a, a few thousand a year just from people yeah. stealing the images um, from that's, that done. I should look at that. I should look at that and have someone do that work for me. It's, uh, they've got a free plan as well. So um, yeah. it's definitely yeah. worth looking into. The way that they work is um, basically they get uh, half of anything that's settled. Right. So yeah, they, they do enough. the work in, in finding it and, and contacting it. You get to decide as to whether or not it's an official use or whether or not to set the dogs on them. Uh, and yeah, um, fair enough. And then they basically go after it. I had somebody steal one of my firework photos and use it for a, um iTunes album. Mm-hmm. And so that ended up being a $4,000 payment for me. Right, right. It's worth doing. Um, okay, so uh, coming to the end now, um, whereabouts can people find you and and explore your work? Well, my I have my own website, which is uh, www.neilprothero.com, uh, N-E-I-L-P-R-O-T-H-E-R-O-E.com. And we also, the, the workshops and tours that we run, uh, I, I do it in conjunction with a colleague, uh, is picturethis.kiwi. Uh, that's that's the on that website. We have details of our New Zealand trips, uh, whether they're private tours for individuals or small groups or um, planned workshop uh, itineraries. Uh, we also here we do uh, one of the things we sort of do a little bit differently is we run social photography weekends. We uh, we we. We go to locations for a two, three, or four night stay and make it a very social get together of photographers um, of all levels of experience and enthusiasm. Uh, so there's help on offer if people want to make use the weekend to to just improve their skills a little bit, and if they just want to come along and have a good time and photograph some beautiful scenery and enjoy a little bit of wine and good food with us as a small group, then we think that's a nice angle to uh, to promote. So we do that. We do four or five of those trips each year. And um, as of this year, we've done our overseas trip to France. Uh, next year, we're back there in June, June and July, and also a trip to Venice and the Dolomites in Italy in early June. Um, so our branching overseas is something we're really excited about. And, of course, coming from Europe myself, I've got a, a good number on the ground in terms of um, knowing where to go and how to set those things up. It's not a totally foreign land to me. And France in particular, uh, somewhere I've got a very close relationship with. I used to live there. I speak French. And um, so those itineraries are, are great fun to organize. So it's picture this dot kiwi. Brilliant. Uh, and so... First of all, I want to say thank you for reaching out and and coming on to the show. Uh, I've enjoyed the uh, conversation and I'm sure other people will too. Um, Is there anybody that you want me to look at that you may find inspiring to reach out to? Well, um, a great um, influence actually uh, for me in recent years has been Mark Munch 
from the US. And um, Mark is a friend of mine as well as my boss, actually, because I represent his company in New Zealand. And I'm also running a trip to France for him next year as well. Uh, but Mark is the son of David Munch, who was a prolific landscape photographer in the U.S. in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And he, in turn, is the son of um, Joseph Munch, who is a contemporary of Ansel Adams and did a lot of work in the southwestern states. So it's a dynasty of uh, photographers. Uh, Mark is, the, is a, an acclaimed landscape photographer in his own right. And uh, I'm very, very privileged to be able to work um, both with him and uh, for his company uh, here and and overseas. And he's been a great influence on me, not not so much from 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 the work he does, but just having the opportunity to photograph alongside him and talk photography. Um, my interview for my job with them was uh, high up in the Sierra Nevada in California. Uh, out all night photographing the Milky Way when the when the there was a cloud inversion over the bay over Santa Barbara. So that was uh, that was seven or eight years ago. Um, what a fun night that was! You're talking to you know one of the one of the great photographers of the world and just out all night photographing the night sky as part of a job interview. It's great fun. Brilliant. So um, uh, again, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I've really enjoyed thank it. Thank you very much. Um, and so uh, that brings us to the end of the show. Uh, all the notes and everything will be in a full article over on thephotographyjunkie.com. All the links that Neil's mentioned will also be on there as well, so that you can find them through that way. Uh, that leads me to say it's easy if you put the effort in. This is The Photography Junkie.